everybody. Welcome to Water's Edge Church. Um, if you're new or if you're visiting us maybe for the first time or haven't been here for a while, I'm Tara. I'm on staff here at the church as the music director. I actually am sitting in the auditorium right now and it's odd because I'm echoing. I can hear my own voice coming back at me. I just finished recording services for the nine o'clock and uh, service and um, so it's just still so weird to me that I don't have anyone to be singing with, that I'm, I'm recording myself and watching myself on camera and listening to myself sing, which is one of the worst things ever to have to do. But um, I, I, miss see, I miss hearing your voices. I miss seeing your faces as, as you're singing and smiling. And a lot of you will put your hands up in the air and worship God. And, and I can see that you're engaged, um, which is what my job is, is leading you into the presence of God on a Sunday morning and hopefully sometimes during the week too. Um, but I just, I just want you to know I miss you, and I, I hope that even though this is an odd time, that some of you are still at home lifting those hands up to God, um, maybe kneeling on the floor or standing in your living room and not completely laid out on the couch, um, and uh, just singing along with full hearts and, and minds and voices like we did when we were together. Um, you should be very well rested because we got an extra hour of sleep last night. And so Kel's message should not put you to sleep this morning. Wink, wink. <laughs> Just know, friends, that I love you and I miss you. And I'm so glad whether you're online this morning or whether you are one of the few that are coming to the church and, and worshiping with us, that, that we're glad that you are here and, and that... We are happy that you are tuning into Water's Edge, or maybe you call Water's Edge home. Miss you all. Enjoy the service. See you later. One, two, three, four. <laughs> There is hope 
Hey there, Leanne here, just popping in to intro the kids portion of our service today. Uh, so does it ever feel like your brain just sort of runs away with you? You know, like you're trying to take a math test and all of a sudden all you can think about is koala bears on skateboards? Okay, maybe not that, but I'm sure you'd agree that sometimes our minds get stuck on things we'd rather not be thinking about. So today, our video taken from our elementary school curriculum is going to talk about exactly that. Here you go. What just happened? I just, I thought about the fact that some flowers have thorns, and if you walk by them, they can scratch you. I don't understand you. Well, John, it's like this. Dog poo on new shoes and old rotten cabbage. Expired goat's milk and overweight baggage. Using a dull spoon to shave off my scruff. This is just some of my least favorite stuff. Flu germs in smoothies and watered down soda. Hearing the spoilers about Baby Yoda. My leg impaled by a billy goat's gruff. This is just some of my least favorite stuff. You put a lot of thought into this. You have no idea. These stings on eyelids and freeze pops in bathrooms. Falling from tall trees, smelling diesel car fumes. Rice Krispies with mayonnaise, not marshmallow fluff. This is just some of my least favorite stuff. When I'm laughing, when my team wins, when I'm feeling rad, I simply remember my least favorite stuff, and then I don't feel so glad. It's Bible story time with Kellen. What's up, fellas? Just trying to cheer this guy up. Why? What's wrong? Well, Kellen, it's like this. No! Not sure what's going on, but can you guys help me out with today's story? Sure, what did you have in mind? This. <laughs> Hello, and welcome to the host feud. We are joined today by our contestants, Brandon's team and John's team. Brandon, who have you brought with you today? Uh, it, well, it looks like I have a mannequin uh, with my picture on it. Not sure how helpful that's going to be. <laughs> Speak for yourself, Brandon. Okay, that's weird. Uh, and also, I have a picture of my childhood cat, Catherine the Great. Hey, ow. Hello, Kellen. Fantastic. John, who's on your team? Well, I have an enlarged picture from my eighth grade yearbook. Hey, Kellen. Hey, me. You look great. No, you look great. Aww. And uh, also on my team is a potato. Top of the morning, everyone. <laughs> okay. Well, there you go. Let's hop to it. Let's play the host feud. The top eight answers are on the board. We ask the question, according to the Apostle Paul in Philippians 4.8, what kinds of things should you think about? Brandon? Dull things. Dull things. Dull things, yes. All right, let's see dull things. Ooh, I am so sorry, Brandon. John? Uh, things that are noble. Yeah, 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 you should think of noble oh, good things. answer. All right. Let's see, Noble. Yes. Number two, Noble Things, John. Do you want to play or pass? Uh, what do you want to do? Play, play, let's play. We're hey, we gonna play. Let's play. Kellen. We're gonna play, Kellen. Okay, I, I think we're gonna play, Kellen. We're gonna play. Kellen. We're gonna play. They're going to play. John's yearbook photo. According to Paul, what kind of things should you think about? Um, 
I'm going to have to say excellent thing. Good answer. Good, good answer. 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 Alright. Let's see excellent things. Yes. Number seven. Well done. Potato, what do you think about? Well, as a potato, people always want to add things to me or cut me into little pieces. Tater tots, french fries, hash browns. But I prefer just being a pure potato. So I'm going to say pure things. Good answer. That's a good answer. Oh, good answer. Good answer. All right. Let's see pure things. Oh. Number four. Nice job, potato. Back to you, John. Let's go with uh, lovely things. Good answer. Good answer. Show me lovely. <laughs> you Yay. got it. John's yearbook photo. According to Paul, what kind of things should you think about? I don't know. How about uh, things or people you respect? Good answer. Good yeah. answer. Good answer. Good answer. Eighth line. grade John wants you to show him some respect. Number oh, yes. six. John's team, you are on a roll. Potato, according to Paul, what kinds of things should you think about? Oh, I know what I think about a lot. Ketchup. Good answer. Good answer. Good answer. Good answer. Um, show me ketchup. Ooh, that was your first strike. Two more, and Brandon's team has a chance to steal. What are you thinking about, John? What will Paul say? Um, um, I'm thinking about praiseworthy things. Praiseworthy things. Yes, good answer. Show me good praiseworthy. Answer. Number eight, worthy of praise. John's yearbook photo. Uh, what was the question again? According to Paul, what kinds of things should you think about? Right, right, right. Oh, well, show me what is right. No, I was just... Oh, you got it. Number three. Gnarly. <laughs> One answer left. Potato? Corned beef hash. That's a good answer. <laughs> oh, what? No, that's just wrong. Show me corned beef hash. Shocking. It comes down to this, John. One answer left. You get it right, and you win. You miss it, and Brandon's team gets a chance to steal. The number one answer is still on the board. According to the Apostle Paul in Philippians 4.8, what kinds of things should you think about? Uh, I don't know. Uh, uh, we need an answer. Um, uh, Ooh, so sorry, John's team. All right, Brandon's team, do you have an answer? A ball's a yarn. Goldfish. Myself. Uh, balls things that are on. scary. Did I say that? Scary Catnip. things. Uh, really scary things. Scary things. So scary. Man, I wish this was a true or false quiz. That's it. True or false. Uh, true. Uh, you think of things that are true. That's it. Brandon's team wins. All right. Yeah, we win. Wow. Thank you to <laughs> both our contestants. This was the host yeah. team. We'll see you next time. Great job. Great job. Oh, good. Good on you. That was fun, Kellen. Yeah, definitely. No doubt. Thanks for helping, guys. So to review, the Apostle Paul wrote this in Philippians 4, 8. Finally, my brothers and sisters, always think about what is true. Think about what is noble, right, and pure. Think about what is lovely and worthy of respect. If anything is excellent or worthy of praise, think about those kinds of things. Oh, I think I get it. I've been choosing to think about things that are negative, things that aren't lovely or pure or true. I, I should be focusing on what Paul wrote about instead. Definitely. It may not feel like it sometimes, but you are in charge of what you think. Maybe you can't control every single thought that enters your brain, but you can definitely decide what you focus on. And if we focus on these things, it can help us live and think a little more like Jesus. Thanks, Kellen. You got it. I'll see you guys later. See you. So what do you tend to focus on? Is it things that are true, admirable, noble, and lovely? Take a few minutes to think about this and talk about it with some of the people around you. 
how could making changes in the way that you think and the things that you think about affect the way you see the world and treat the people you encounter? Thanks so much for tuning in. Just a note, even though this is airing on November 1, today is wrapping up our October curriculum. If you and your family would like an interactive engagement packet that goes along with the videos we're uploading on YouTube, please email me at leanne at h2oedge.org. Just a reminder, the full version of all the videos we're showing are available on our YouTube channel. We'll see you next week.
stop, you never stop working Even when I don't see it, you're working Even when I don't feel it, you're working You never stop, you never stop working You never stop, you never stop working Even when I don't see it, you're working Even when I don't feel it, you're working You never stop, you never stop working You never stop
Great is your faithfulness, faithfulness. I'm still in your hands. This is my confidence. You never fail. Your promise still stands. Great is your faithfulness, your faithfulness. I'm still in your hands. This is my confidence. You never
He rose and conquered the grave. Jesus conquered the grave. Yes, Lord, we praise you for conquering the grave. Here's Pastor Kel. For those of you that don't know, uh, November 1st is actually a holiday in most churches. It's called All Saints Day. It's a time when we remember all the saints that have gone on before us. It's a time when we remember loved ones uh, that we have lost in the church. And, and so today I thought I would offer, offer up a prayer. Uh, this comes from an old Irish prayer. Ho hope you like it. We give you thanks, O oh God, for all the saints who ever worshipped you, whether in bush arbors or cathedrals, whether wooden churches or crumbling cement meeting houses, where your name was lifted and adored. We give you thanks, O oh God, for hands lifted in praise, manicured hands and hands stained with grease or soil, strong hands and those gnawed with age, holy hands. Used as wave offerings across the land, we thank you, God, for hardworking saints. Whether hard-hatted or steel-booted, head-ragged or aproned, blue-collared or three-piece suited, they left their mark on the earth for you, for us, for our children to come. Thank you, God, for the tremendous sacrifices made for those who have gone before us. Bless the memories of your saints, God. May we learn how to walk wisely from their examples of faith, dedication, worship, and love. We pray all this in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit as we remember today. Amen. to our series called Talking Points, where we are talking about politics and church. Uh, my name is Kel Penny, and I apologize for those of you that are normally here. Uh, normally I have screens set up and I have slides for you, but uh, this week I've been really sick, and so I'm just kind of hoping to get through this, and, uh, but I think the message is really, really important this week. And so why are we talking about politics in church? Well, because right now politics is everywhere on our minds. This is, will be the last service that uh, we have before the election. And, and so right now you can't turn your head either way without running into some sort of political discussion. And, and when something like this happens that dominates what's going on in our world, we we have a choice. We can either ignore it or we can talk about it. And, and even though talking about it is probably the more difficult thing to do right now, I'm choosing to talk about it. So far in this series, in the first week, uh, we talked about how politics is dividing our country. But Jesus prayed that instead of being divided, that we would be one, that we would be together, that we would be unified in the church. Last week, we talked about how we can choose people over politics, how Jesus chose people over pretty much everything. And as people who follow Jesus, we should do the same. We saw the calling of Jesus as one to care for one another, to bear one another's burdens, ultimately to love one another. But sometimes it's hard to love one another, isn't it? Sometimes people are just so different than you and me or you and someone else. Uh, sometimes people do things that just annoy you. Uh, to bring up a, a silly kind of example about this, uh, there are some people in this world that are on-time people, and there are some people in this world that are late people. Now, I'm generally an on-time person, and what that means is that if it's just me involved and I have to be somewhere, I will be early. Uh, that's the way I was raised. That's just how I am. Uh, but 
There are other people in this world, I have learned, that didn't grow up the way that I did, or if, if they did, then it didn't stick. Um, they'll shoot to show up right on time, right when they're supposed to get there. If they're supposed to be there at 8, they will shoot to be there right at 8. And uh, they will leave the house with just enough time to get there, and if anything happens, they'll be late. Now, if you are an on-time person, you know exactly what I'm talking about. But if you're a late person, then you probably don't understand at all what I'm saying. And just so you know, you're a late person, <laughs> and that's okay. Now, this is a silly example, but it illustrates that it is really easy for us to break down situations and to classify people based on their behavior. And what will then typically happen is that when we're out in the world, we use this knowledge to classify other people we meet based on the knowledge that we have. And if someone shows up late to a meeting and, and gives the excuse that they got stuck behind a train, you'll automatically think, oh, they must be a late person. And, and you know, that's right. And, and we do this all the time. We do this with all sorts of things in life, not just about if someone's a late person or an early person, but this it, it, and we do it so much that it can be a dangerous thing. And, and what we are seeing right now in our political world a lot is that people are judging others and, and people are, are using this kind of thinking to, to classify others in broad strokes when it's not necessarily true. So today I thought we would talk about how we view people, how we see people. This sermon is entitled, How Do You see people. And the thing that I want to begin from is a sociological and a psychological principle called the fundamental attribution error. Now, I know many of you might be thinking, okay, what the heck is that? Fundamental attribution error? That, it's, it's, it's jumble. Uh, but stick with me. It's, it's important. This term, it's a social psych psychological term that was coined by Lee Ross. And, and what this idea states is that if someone does something and we see it, we have a tendency to attribute what they did to their character instead of their circumstances. However, when something happens to us, we don't attribute it to our character. We instead, we attribute it to the circumstances. So to explain this, if someone comes in late for an important meeting, you will have a natural tendency to attribute this to them being a late person. You attribute it to their character. Oh, they were late. They're probably always late. They're a late person. And they might be. You don't know. But you don't necessarily 100% know that. What if they planned ahead and they got out to their car and they found that it had a flat tire? And they are five minutes late to this important meeting, but normally they're very on time, but they changed the tire. And they were planning on being 30 minutes early, but because they had to, tra they had to change a the tire, they were just a little bit late. That's the fundamental attribution error. Because if the same thing would happen to us, if the roles were to be reversed and it was our car that had a flat tire, we wouldn't attribute that to our character. We wouldn't attribute it to our personality, but we would attribute it to the bad luck of having to change a tire. So what we need to know is that we have a cognitive bias in our own brains that makes us assume that when we see somebody do something that we attribute it to our character. That's our bias. If we see someone do something, we attribute it to who they are. Now, this applies greatly to how we see people. If we see someone doing something that we don't like, that we don't agree with, then we have a tendency to label that person as bad or evil. There are times, especially in modern stories and myths, that people like this are made out to be either heroes or villains. <clears throat> Think about the story of Robin Hood. If you are a rich person riding in a carriage and all of a sudden you are stopped and robbed at knife point or arrow point, as it were, you'd probably label that person as evil. But when we have the perspective of knowing that Robin Hood isn't just someone that's out there stealing from the rich to make themselves richer, but instead he's stealing from the rich to give to the poor because there's an evil steward that is ruling and is overtaxing and bringing out about injustice in the world, our perspective changes. We shift our view of Robin Hood from a villain to a hero because he's fighting against injustice. Now, we may not like his methods, 
but we see the purpose. That is overcoming our cognitive bias, and that is overcoming the fundamental attribution error. And it works really well in stories. It works when we can zoom out and see all the details. But in everyday life, that is just not how it works. We don't get a chance to see all the details. We don't get an opportunity to see the circumstances that bring people to where they are. So what do we do? We assume that what we are seeing is a part of their character. Now apply this thinking to what we're seeing going on in politics right now. We have a tendency to see that the Democrats are all whatever, and that the, or the, that the Republicans are all, and if you start to look at it, you'll see it all over the news. People are painting with broad, broad strokes right now, and we do this too. We fall back into our cognitive biases all the time. Now, this is also not anything that's new. I expect that even though the term has only been around for about 50 years, that this is something that people have been dealing with for centuries. But the question then is, how should we see people? Is this the way that God wants us to be? Looking at people and then how, finally, how do we apply this to the, where we are today with our own political situation? First, let's take a look at how God views people. If, if we want to learn how we are to view people, we should see how God views people. For this, there are really two things that I want you to know, and it comes from a story um, in the Old Testament. And, and so the first thing that you need to know is, one, that God does not view us by our outward appearances. And those of us that are at home right now watching on the internet are like, thank God, I haven't taken a shower today. But <laughs> in the Old Testament, there was a time when God commanded the prophet Samuel to choose a new king of Israel. The first king had done some bad things, and and the first king was someone that the people chose for themselves. This time, it was God's turn, though, and uh, God was going to pick a king. So God sent Samuel to out to, and and for those of you that know, that are familiar with the story, God sent Samuel to Jesse's house. Jesse had eight sons, and, and so when Samuel showed up offering a sacrifice, Jesse was sure to be there, but he only showed up with seven of his sons. Now, the youngest son was kept back to watch the flocks, but as these seven boys stood before Samuel, Samuel was amazed. Jesse's oldest son was named Eliab, and, and he was tall and strong and handsome, and when Samuel saw him, he said, surely the Lord's anointed, surely the one that the Lord is going to pick to be king stands here before the Lord as he looks at Eliab. And that's exactly how Saul, the first king, had been chosen. He had been chosen because he was tall and handsome. He was a kingly looking guy. And here standing before Samuel is another of the same type and stock, another seemingly fit person for the throne. But here is what God said to Samuel. God said to Samuel, do not consider his appearance or his height, for I have rejected him. The Lord does not look at the things that people look at. People look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. God God doesn't look at our outward appearance. Instead, God looks at the heart. And for those of you that don't know that story that we were just reading from, Samuel and God make Jesse go out and get the youngest son. And, And that son ends up being David, the greatest king in Israel's history. He would go on to unite the country, to secure their borders, and to create a dynasty. God didn't see a young boy that was being left out. Instead, God saw the king that was inside, the man that would be, because God didn't look at the outward appearance. Now, we don't have God's insight into life and the lives of those around us, but what we do have is the ability to not judge people for what we see on the surface, to be like God in this way to not judge the outward appearance. And that is what the fundamental attribution error is all about. It's all about judging people by what we see on the outside and attributing it to what we believe that they are on the inside. So if we're going to follow God in this into not looking at outward appearances, we need to instead start looking at intentions. We need to instead start looking at circumstances to take into account the whole of the person, not just what's going on in front of us. But when we do this, we run into a wall. 
Because let me tell you, this takes work. It's much easier just to look at someone and judge them. If we're going to not judge them by what they're doing, then we have to do some work. If we don't want to judge someone by their outward appearance, then we have to get to know them. There's no other way around it. We have to get to know people. We have to build relationships with them if we don't want to judge them. There's a famous phrase out there about not judging a book by its cover. Well, if you want to judge that book not by its cover, what do you have to do? You got to read it. Well, it's the same way with people. If you want to get to, if you want to really judge someone, if you want to really understand where they're coming from, you, you got to get to know them. So that's number one today. God doesn't look at the outward appearance. Neither should we. The next thing that we pull from the Samuel story about how God sees us is that God looks at our hearts. Now, this might seem obvious, but I think it bears pointing out, not only does God not look at the outward appearance, but God sees the intentions of our hearts. God is able to look at our hearts. God is able to see where we've come from and what we are going to do. God sees the heart. I wonder how much of our lives would change if instead of judging people by their outward appearances, if we started searching for their intentions behind their actions. When we see a stressed out parent at their worst in the grocery store yelling at their kids, do we judge them and think they are bad parents? Of course we do. We've all done it. But what we don't know is what they're going through. I heard a story one time about a man that was riding a bus late at night home. And, and as he was riding the bus home, he saw that there was this young family that was there. And, and there were three kids, and the kids just seemed to be going wild. It was 11 o'clock at night. And of course, the man started thinking, man, what are, what are these kids doing up this late? How, how do they have this much energy? And, and they're just running up and down the aisle of the bus, yelling and screaming. And, and, and then clearly he saw that, you know, the children's father was right there, and he just seemed to be staring out the window, not doing anything about it. Well, after a long time of this going on, um, the man decided, well, surely this, this father doesn't know what he's doing. He can't be a good parent. He needs someone to teach him how to be a parent to his kids. And so the man approached uh, the father, uh, tapped him on the shoulder, and, and, and he was ready to release his anger and his venom uh, that these kids don't know what they're doing. These kids weren't raised right. You know, what do you think you're doing? And so he tapped on his shoulder and said, sir, your children are misbehaving. And, and the man startled as if he were dreaming, and, and, and he came out of that. And, and it was at that moment, as, as, as the father turned around, that the irritated man saw that he had clearly been crying. His, his eyes were puffy and red. He had bags under his eyes. And, and immediately the father apologized, and, and he calmed the kids down. And he explained, uh, as, as the kids calmed down, he, he, he kind of took them in and said, he's like, look, I'm really sorry. We're on our way home from the hospital, and their mother has just passed away, but I don't know how to tell them. I don't know how I'm going to explain it to them. So, you know, I was just letting them play a little bit. We see often what we want to see when we look at others. God shows us another way, though. God shows us not to look at the outward appearance, but to look at the heart. If that man on the bus knew what was on that other man's heart, that father's heart, he wouldn't have said a word. He would have actually probably tried to help. We can't know someone's heart unless we do the work of getting to know them. There's one more thing that we should talk about today when it comes to how God sees us. There are some of us out there that when we think about God and how holy God is and how good God is, and, and then when we consider ourselves, we start thinking about the life that we've lived, and we have a hard time believing that God would ever see anything good in us. We have a hard time believing that our own hearts are good. And if this is you today, then there's something that you need to know. Hear these words from the book of 2 Corinthians, starting in verse 17. Paul says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old has gone. The new is here. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. He has committed to us the message of reconciliation. 
We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. If you think that when God looks at you, that all he sees is the things that you've done, that all God sees is the sin that you have in your life, the mistakes that you've made, the brokenness that seems to follow you around. If you believe that you are unworthy of God, then you need to know, you have to know, that God doesn't see your righteousness when God looks at you. God doesn't see your lack of righteousness, rather. Instead, God sees Jesus' righteousness. You see, church, is not only a a gathering of a bunch of holy people. Instead, it's a gathering of a bunch of sinners, a bunch of people that feel the way that you feel, a bunch of people that have made mistakes the same as you have. But now we see that God doesn't see our sin anymore, but instead sees Christ's righteousness as our own. This is what it means to believe in Christ. This is what it means to be saved by Christ, to be reconciled, as Paul said to the Corinthians. We are given the ministry to sharing this with other people. So we shouldn't be people who are judging others by what they've done. We shouldn't be judging people by what we see them do. Instead, we should be sharing with them how God sees them. God sees Jesus and the sacrifice that Jesus made in them. All we have to do is believe. and Anybody can do that. We shouldn't be living our lives by the fundamental attribution error. But instead... We should be helping people to know that God loves them, that Jesus died for their sins. So let's bring all of this back to politics, shall we? The question becomes, how are you seeing others? And when it comes to politics, how are you seeing others that are different from you? And finally, how should we be viewing others as this whole election season comes to a head? Well, with that, I actually want to leave you with some advice from the founder of our denomination, John Wesley, because there was a time that he was basically asked this exact same thing. There was an election coming up, and and he went and he met with some of the Methodists, and and I'm not sure of all the circumstances that were surrounding the election over there in England in the 1700s, but um, he was asked very plainly, how should Methodists vote? And, And this is what he said, and this is from October 6, 1774. And and these are the words of John Wesley. He said, I met those of our society who had votes in the ensuing election, and here's how I advised them. Number one, to vote without fee or reward for the person they judged most worthy. In other words, don't be bribed. Uh, Don't expect a reward for your vote, but to vote for the person who is the most worthy in their mind. Number two, to speak no evil of the person they voted against. And then number three, to take care that their spirits were not sharpened against those that voted on the other side. Oh, how different would our world be if we were to take that advice, if we were to go out and vote for the person who we thought was most worthy to be president or senator or governor or, you know, house representative. But not only that, but we took care not to speak evil of the other person. Man, that is what it feels like our whole world is full of right now. People speaking evil of the other side. And then to take care that our spirits were not sharpened against those that voted on the other side. How wonderful would it be if we could actually achieve the prayer of Jesus to be unified, one in spirit, no matter who we vote for in this upcoming election. So, that's it for me today. Let's pray. God, thank you for your message of peace. Thank you for your message of love. Thank you that you don't take what you see in us and define us by our sins. Instead, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That proves God's love for us. And so, God, thank you for your love, a love that that goes over our sin, a love that makes a path for us to come to you. God, for all those out there that are troubled, all those out there that 
are hurting today, God. For all of those out there that do not think that they are worthy enough, I ask that your grace, your peace, your love would be upon them. May they see you. May they feel you. In Jesus' name, amen. and maybe share with somebody this week that you believe in that name, that powerful name of Jesus. We love you, and as I always say, we hope you have a great week. We'll see you next time.